Well, we've arrived in Nakano. That's where I'm staying this time. I'm walking through the Sun Mall to get to my Airbnb. I haven't been here in a bunch of years. Let's see how it goes. It's uh, raining pretty hardcore, as you can maybe hear. Maybe you can hear that. I'm staying in an Airbnb on the fifth floor, so it's not quite as loud as it would be if you were down on the street. Just took a whole bunch of flights. I'm pretty hungry because of COVID and people not wearing masks and stuff. I opted to... Uh, not eat for the duration of the flight. So you can imagine I'm pretty hungry right now. But everything's closed. And it's raining, and I don't have an umbrella. And I forgot to bring a little power adapter thingy so I could plug my laptop in. All the classic stuff. I haven't been traveling. I used to travel, I don't know, every other month or something like that. Now it's been almost three years and I decided to spend a whole 12 days in Tokyo what was I thinking <laughs> but it's interesting to be somewhere else again I think I'm gonna go to the Daiso that I can see from my window here and try to get maybe a lavalier mic get that power adapter maybe some sort of a food I don't know I might just be eating peanuts today. Umbrella at least. Good lord. People are getting soaked. I'll be here at the Tokyo Game Show. I'll be updating you about that and other things. I'm s certain that I will be going to many book-offs and the Mandarake Galaxy in Nakano Broadway and check out all the vegetarian restaurants around here. I don't know. I'll just keep y'all up to date. I'll let you know what's going on. Bye for now. I'm on my way to Nintendo's Tokyo head headquarters right now. Uh, about to take the train pretty soon. Oops, I'm standing by the women-only car. Well, I'm not going to get on it. It's just, uh, it's quieter here. So yeah, gonna go see what Nintendo's up to over here. Will Mario be there? That's the first question I'm gonna ask. Is Mario here? I know he, he like, lives in, splits his time between Kyoto and New Donk City, but could be here for a meeting, you don't know. Had my morning vegetarian meal of, uh, natto rice roll which uh, I'm gonna be incredibly tired of in about five minutes, but it is the thing I can eat. Got some jasmine tea latte, which is a new special in uh, Family Mart right now, so it's pretty good. I'm not supposed to have caffeine, but I'm all jisabokeyed out, so, I mean uh, jet lagged, so I might as well just go nuts, why not? Well, talk to y'all pretty soon. Bye for now. Okay, so I'm still on the train to Nintendo, but I thought I should let y'all know that there's a delay on the KO line because of an unidentified noise. And uh, that was very exciting to me. Uh, feeling like I'm in Earth Defense Forest over here. I hope they sort out what that unidentified noise is. Alright. I'm gonna talk to y'all later. So I just left Nintendo. Went from Kanda to Shibuya, where I'm gonna go to a uh, shared workspace for video game people. 
called Asobu. Mario was not there at the Tokyo office. Very disappointing. But I did get to see that Grasshopper Manufacturer and Platinum's offices are both visible from the Nintendo Spire. That's pretty cool. They got a brand new building in Kanda. They're not the only people in the building, but it's a really nice new building. The newest escalator I've ever seen, probably. I also saw Shigesato Itoi's office. The outside of it, anyway. Didn't go in there. I don't know enough about that guy. They'd probably kick me out. You can hear the cicadas are going for it. Alright, I gotta get back to looking at my map here. I don't know where the heck I'm going. Talk to y'all soon. I'm out here at Asobu, which is a mansion a little bit. Co-working space for indie devs and stuff. It's run by Mark McDonald, who worked with uh, Mizuguchi on Tetris Effect and Res Infinite and all those games. They just have indie devs come out here and do work. I don't know. I actually don't know how they fund it. He gave me a, a card and I'm just working out of here for a little while. But um, it's a cool spot. If you're ever in Tokyo and you're a game dev, it's in Shibuya. If you're out here, you should come check it out. They got some Silent Hill looking bathrooms. They're some of the grungiest, terrifyingest looking bathrooms I've ever seen. I love it. It's great. I'm, I'm, I'll see if I can get a photo for including in the podcast somehow or other. It's an, it's an audio thing, so I can't really... It's like it's green, these green doors and all the paint is peeling off and there's... The toilet kind of just looks like a metal bucket and it's really dark and it's really small. The space is really nice, and the bathrooms are just like part of part of the larger building and stuff. Um, I'm not trying to indicate that the whole thing is like Silent Hill. It's 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 in fact very li- nice. Just those bathrooms, um, they really caught my eye. And right across is one of those '80s style buildings that you just don't see anymore that have the the glass cubes. You know those thick glass cubes instead of windows. I love those things. I especially love them as interior design, but people like to make, you know, waves with them and stuff. They're super neat, and I think they should make a comeback because well-insulated, uh, pretty much, as far as glass goes, and they look cool as heck. Uh, it's raining still. It's nice out here. I'm actually having a better time than I was at PAX. I mean, PAX was okay. We got a lot of good stuff out of it, but... Out here, it's like, I don't know, maybe this is weird to say, but everyone's kind of like, happy to see me. (laughs) Because you don't get indie devs out here that much that are like, trying to do some interesting things. So Japanese companies kind of are happy to meet with me. All the Americans that have been doing things haven't seen me in a long time. It's just nice to feel like people are interested in me being around. Is that... Is this hubris? Is this uh, self-importance? I don't know. But it's just cool to be out here in a place where everyone's like, Yeah! Come on by! Let's hang out! Let's go do stuff! I guess that's kind of the vibe of just travel existing again after many years of COVID. Not that COVID's ever, but uh, yeah, it's cool. I love looking at the all the rooftop spaces. There's so many zones outside where there's just like a weird a weird balcony or a strange staircase or a, just like a little area where people can go outside and smoke or whatever. They seem so underutilized out here, but so many of these buildings have them. I like them. I'm on one right now, in fact. I'm standing on a little smoker's area next to a dead spider plant that <laughs> needed to be watered long ago and it's forgotten about here we are i'm out here talking to folks i gotta remember to get other people to say things on this podcast so it's not just me i swear i'll do it next time see you later bye for now okay i gotta update you about the 
a sobu bathroom i was a little i was a little harsh on it it's not like a metal bucket it's actually an extremely nice toilet with like a bidet and everything and they have a little portable air conditioner in there it's 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 super nice it's just kind of industrial looking in there but like outside it looks like silent hill it definitely does give that vibe and it's dark it's like in a dark hallway and so that was why i was given that impression of it being a danger zone but in fact super nice so um don't tell anybody that i said that lol they could probably hear this if they wanted to it's nice it's a nice bathroom final answer bye well i'm back in akihabara this has got some of that shojin ryori they have here it's the vegetarian place that i always eat with this exchange rate food is getting dirt cheap it's wild i just paid 1210 yen for a lunch set that had like eight things in it that's it's that's like nine dollars right now it's bizarre and this is like a kind of a fancy place well i'm gonna take it while i can get it right now i'm walking over to the other side of the electric town exit I'm gonna go check that building that used to have the Maid Raymond that Tim and I were joking about the last time we did one of these episodes which was I don't know like five or six or seven years ago <clears throat> I know that it shut down but I want to see what's there instead so I'm going through the little underpass what? There's still a Maid Riemann sign. Well, the legend lives on. It doesn't have the huge, giant Maid Riemann that it used to, but there's still a sign. So, I guess I don't have to worry. Maid Riemann lives on. Alright, I'm gonna go buy about, uh, five million things. I don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen. I just got some money at the post office. I'm gonna buy some video games. I've gotten some requests from folks that I talk about the games that I bought, so I'm gonna try to do that. Hopefully I can do it with somebody else, so it's a little more entertaining. I'm gonna see if I can do it with two Frenchmen who will probably not name themselves. We'll see. Alright, I'm gonna let y'all go. As though... You're going to wait more than five seconds until you hear my voice again, lol. Talk to you later. Bye for now. I don't know if you can hear that. That's the Maid Riemann theme song. All's right with the world. God's in his heaven, etc. Everybody's Maid Riemann. I forget if we didn't explain this joke last time. Um, it's supposed to be... It's got maids, and it is dreaming. It's supposed to be like maid dreaming, and they put it together. But it's spelled maid reaming. And, uh, I mean, how could you unsee it? Let's get that chorus again. All right, that's enough of that. It's getting windy. Probably sounds like crap. Bye for now.
All right, so here's something. I bought a lavalier mic. It sounds a lot better, doesn't it? This is this is what Akihabara is literally for. I realized as I was walking around. It's like, why am I making bad sound when I could just go buy some things in the very place that it's supposed to happen? So yeah, but a little USB-C to headphone converter, headphone jack converter thing. And then I bought a lav mic for like $2.50. <laughs> and here we are. So things are gonna sound a little less worse than they did before. I'm still talking through a mask, so it's gonna sound a little bad, but whatever. I'm pleased. I had the, uh, the true vintage Akihabara experience just now. Just walked in, into a place, asked an old man if he had it, and he's like, hmm, I don't know if that exists. And then, uh, turned out, just could buy two things, put them together. And there you go. All right, I'm going to hit up the soft map. Uh, I accidentally stumbled toward the super potato first, which was not, not what I was trying to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go there later. I am going to go there. I'm sorry. We're going to hit the soft map. We're going to hit the trader. We're going to get to that mandarake. We're going to go to friends, even though it's kind of a shell of what it used to be. I'm going to check out all the arcade games I can't buy at, um, whatever that place is called, Mac Japan. Yeah. All right, I'll talk to y'all later. Bye for now. I'm here in front of the Shambara. You can hear their theme song going. It's good times. I just came from Traders and bought a whole bunch of stuff, too much stuff, and found out at the end of the purchase that tomorrow they have a 7% off everything sale. Oops. Whatever. What can you do? I didn't want to back out of the whole thing and cause a situation. But learn my lesson. Read all the stuff on the walls first. I love this kind of old school terrible brass. It's very good. It's good times. Well, gotta hit up some more spots. I'm not going to give you a report on everything, but that 7% discount, it's gnawing at me. It's got a shambara. See y'all later. Bye for now. You know, I'm realizing the reason people keep asking me to say what I got is because they want to know what I got. So, <laughs> if you want to hear me talk about video games, on the video game podcast, so maybe I'll tell you a couple. Uh, the big ticket items that I got, I got a copy of um, Super God Trooper Zeroigar on the PCFX. It's uh, sun damaged, no obi, but it's like the cheapest price I've ever seen, so I went for it. That's the only shooting game on the PCFX. Uh, well, full official shooting game anyway. And it's made by Hudson. It's not the best you'll ever see, but it's pretty good, and it's got, like, transparency. I can I could never tell if it's real transparency or fake, but I think it's real. That's pretty cool. There aren't that many games that do that on there. What else did I get? I got Gun Frontier. It's pretty good. Taito Shooter. That got ported to the Saturn, and it was ported by, like, a team that had to look at the game and try to reassemble it. So they didn't have the source code or anything, and they were just, like, going for it. People say that makes it an inferior port, but, which I'm sure it does, but it also makes it interesting to me. So I got that. I also got a, finally, a non-ruined copy of Lady Sword, which is a, um, Games Express, uh, pirate PC Engine game. Usually on that game, the uh, it's, it's, it's an RPG. It's not like the most amazing thing, but 
it's interesting the the contemporary pirate games that they had on that console and the thing that usually happens is that the paint on the hue card separates from the hue card and attaches itself to the plastic sleeve and I have two copies of this game both of which have done that in different configurations and I'm hoping that this finally since it, I, I asked the guy and he's like it should be no problem I'm hoping this one's actually properly fixed and uh, not ruined and then I can trade that other one away for the price I paid for this one <laughs> alright well that's a couple of things I got oh I got Dynamite Heady the Japanese version which is easier and has some different stuff in it can't resist that uh, and Tatsujin Tatsujin went down in price up here Tatsujin the uh, Toplan shooter it's like 55 bucks now it used to be ridiculous but I think that reissue made it go down in price alright I'm gonna head up to friends I'll see y'all later bye for now alright I'm chilling with my mask off for a second because I'm drinking a salty lychee beverage in the no smoking zone uh, you can sort of hear there's construction going on there's always been construction going on near friends the store since uh, since I first came here in like 2003 I think it's an interesting situation at friends they for a long time they were like the sort of unknownish place that you could get weird stuff for cheap and uh, they had like, just like a, a grandma running the shop. They still have the grandma running the shop, but uh, just hanging out, talking to people. And then at some point it got to be two floors. They had a lot of stuff. Stuff started getting real expensive in a weird way. It was like the pressure got put on them by Super Potato or something. But I came back this time and it was truly like olden times. They're back to one floor. They had way less stuff in a pretty wild way, but everything was much cheaper, which it was a big surprise to me. Found a lot of cheap stuff, um, but unfortunately I could not purchase it as I reached my cash withdrawal limit for the day, embarrassingly. Um, I can only get go on in which is like I guess it's like four hundred dollars now or less and uh, my purchase was slightly more than that and so I wrote my name and my <laughs> and my phone number down I I didn't realize exactly what she was doing so I was writing she had me write uh, she's like sign this and put your phone number on the back of this receipt and then you can have it tomorrow and uh, when I signed it she was like whoa but because I, I did like a signature so she's like w what are even these letters um, I, I guess she actually meant she wanted me to write my name down uh, she said sign so I just did the scroll and she's like whoa uh, but anyway <laughs> she's a nice old lady I helped her um, discern what this guy was he was asking for uh, guardian superheroes and she's like is that on Famicom or Mega Drive and he's like uh, I don't know uh, oh yeah uh, the reason I brought that up is because I have not seen uh, very many um, Caucasian shoppers around here, which is way like the old days. Like, obviously I'm here on a business visa, very few other people can get here, but it's still kind of a surprise to me. But the only place I saw white folks was in Friends, so far. I haven't been to Super Potato, that's going to be only white people, but still. Um, that was a surprise, because like... I went to some other places first, and Friends is... Friends used to be, like, the end-of-the-line weirdo stop. And, uh, and there were just white dudes who can't speak Japanese in there. That was a surprise. What are they doing outside of Super Potato? Uh, no offense if any of the people listening to this are the people that were in there, lol. But yeah, once I do purchase it, I'm gonna get the cheapest copy of Mad Stalker for PlayStation that I've seen in a while. Which is still too much money. Um, I'm getting a some sort of like Grandia special event CD single that came out. Uh, what else? What else was was in my pile? I had some kind of some guides. Oh yeah, that's another thing I wanted to talk to y'all about. Guidebooks. 
are really disappearing from the nation of Japan. It's getting harder and harder to find them, especially stuff that's not like Famicom, Super Famicom. So I got some sort of guidebook for the Saturn. Oh yeah, I got Princess Crown. Um, that's pretty cool. But guidebooks are really dwindling, and there's a lot of stuff that's just kind of like going away. I wonder where the heck it went. Like, did shipping guidebooks out of the country get super cheap? I don't know what happened. Anywho, I'm going to go back and get that stuff tomorrow. I'm going to go buy some more games. Maybe I'll talk to you again about that. But I will certainly talk to you again a little later when uh, hopefully I'm meeting Chibi Tech to go look at some uh, wacky cars. I've been warned that the police might come, so I wore my Pig Destroyer shirt just in case. We'll see how that goes. Bye for now. I'll talk to you later. Okay, I'm here with Chibi Tech. We're driving in her uh, Honda. Wait, what, what's it called again? I forget. So it's called a uh, Honda S660. X S660. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. Maybe you can edit out the part where I said it wrong all those times. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if that's possible. So yeah, we're driving on the old uh, Stoko, which we all know from Stoko Highway Battle uh, on the Dreamcast. And you were saying that you, you're very familiar with this from playing it on the Dreamcast? Yes, I have uh, played uh, Tokyo Extreme Racer, or is he on Shinoko Battle, the, the American version of the uh, Shinoko Battle, like, for hours on end when I used to work in a, uh, in a receptionist job and goof off, the, goof off just bringing my Dreamcast every day. Very good. I'm curious, I saw you hit your uh, your hazards a couple times, and I know that people do that on the freeway here. What, what is that for? So it's so it's, it's basically a way of like showing that like it's like a, it's a basically the Subimasen, you know, a car equivalent. Uh, Got it, so like if you sort of cut someone off? Yeah, well, basically anything that, uh, you know, if, for example, if you're going to... Uh, you know, go, into, go onto their lanes, and then you just want to say, oh, thanks for letting me in, or, or if you accidentally cut them off, and then, like, yeah, you, you basically say sumimasen at the end, with, uh, with the hazards. Got it. Cool. Uh, what other questions do I have? Oh, yeah, how, how close is the, is the gearbox on this? It looks like the, sh the, the gears are really close together. Is that, is that the case? Yes, it is, uh, it's meant to, uh, be for like a uh, toge driving and also like circuit so a lot of like the the gearing is like very close ratio or you know like uh, closely uh, together and uh, though it does have a six gear so you know you can at least uh, you know have like sane uh, revs in uh, in highway uh, highway speeds for whatever reason I like the wider apart gearboxes but I'm a I'm a casual driver, right. so. Or, or you're, you know, you're probably because uh, like a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of cruisers have like longer gears, so. That's true. Yeah, because I'm driving my Prelude. Yes. Oh my God, I used to drive a Prelude, the fourth generation one, in fact. Yeah, you were fourth gen. I'm, I'm fifth gen all the way. I, 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 I had a third gen for a long time, and I loved those flippy up lights. Mm. Uh, but then I had to, I had to retire it at some point because. Um, it wouldn't start anymore. I would have to leave it on because I knew that if I turned it off, it wasn't going to start again for like eight hours. Right. Uh, but eventually, I actually like on the day I was taking it to turn into a cube. It turned out that the, there was a little vacuum advance that we were trying to fix, and I replaced it with a part from the junkyard, and it didn't work. Oh my god. And then I replaced it with a new part, and it didn't work. And I was like, okay, clearly it's not this part. But then the day that we were cubing it. My stepbrother brought me another vacuum advance from the junkyard, hmm. and it worked perfectly. And I was like, oh no! Oh my god. <laughs> and so then it got cubed. Uh, very, very sad. So after that, I was like, I gotta get another Prelude. Right. And then I wound up with a fifth gen because uh, I, I just love a rounded wedge. Hmm. My brother actually had a fifth gen. 
period. Yeah. He had like a, the nineteen ninety like the first year of it with the so ninety seven. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was definitely a lot comfier than than the fourth gen. Even though I think the fourth gen is okay is the best one in my opinion, of course. Yeah. I understand. Uh, it's my least favorite. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> but only because of the look of it. I because I the tail lights. It's the tail. Well, it's it's actually the whole thing. I don't like the tail lights, but also the I just the hood. It's so it's so smooth and oblong. It's very Y two K, which is great. But it's just um, I need it to look like a doorstop. Right. Yeah. See the I know that the the fortune was like considered like the like the bastard child. Of, yeah. uh, of the Prelude line just because it had like all this uh, weird things like the Star Trek dash yeah and uh, and also the taillights the taillights were like the ones that people hated the most on the Prelude right but uh, I loved it though because like it was just because it was unusual like that yeah I understand and they did try quite a few things with the Prelude line like the third gen had the four wheel steering so if you if you racked the wheel all the way then the uh, the back wheels would turn very slightly in the opposite direction. Right. Yeah, the the Fortune also had that, but it was like electronically controlled. Right. But unfortunately, the, this was the time during the time that uh, uh, you know, like uh, electronically controlled uh, like uh, sensors were still kind of like you know, in its infancy, like yeah. as far as development. So like a lot of like the four wheel steering uh, uh, modules in the Fortune Prelude like just gave up. Yeah, they failed. Yeah, the third gen, it those those still worked, and I actually found it like like preludes are not meant for drifting whatsoever. Right. But right. in the third gen, you kind of could you could fake drift because of that. Because like if you really turned it, like your wheels were all going that way, and you would you would slide, I guess. Right. Yeah. Just like uh, I know there's a couple of people who like uh, do. Uh, like uh, rear wheel drive conversions of uh, the payload uh, where they they just uh, they just take a longitudinal engine and then just uh, engine swap it and then uh, just basically put a rear drive shaft onto the rear wheels. Well, that's impressive. I hadn't heard about that. Well, I hope that this extremely loud tunnel sounds great to all of you that are listening right now. Can you even hear what we're saying? I don't know. I am so sorry. I should have probably cut the. No, no, no. It's good. We have, we have the top down because it's fun, uh, that's why there's all this noise, that's why we're having to yell into the microphone. I'm going to pause for a minute and we're going to talk again about where we're going after, after, after these messages. Uh, Alright, so uh, Chibi Tech came to meet me in Super Potato where I bought almost nothing and then we went to Mandarake where I bought a lot more things and accidentally set the alarm off. Um, so then we got into her car, and we are driving to Yokohama. And why are we driving to Yokohama? So we are going to Daikoku parking area, which is like basically the, the home base of many Hasibiya, like uh, Tokyo street racers. Yeah, so we're gonna go see some real life initial Ds and uh, I've been informed that sometimes the cops come and uh, so I'm wearing my pig destroyer shirt uh, which I mean I'm not gonna destroy any cops but I'll, I'll think about it <laughs> I'll think about it uh, in, in what capacity do the do the cops break things up usually so what happens sometimes is that um Normally, if you go to the parking area and, you know, just uh, behave yourself, you know, like not rev up your engine or anything, you know, they, they won't care. But once people start, like, you know, like either they start bringing, uh, you know, they start revving, uh, like, their their engines or there's, like, cars that obviously look like they're violating the, you know, like, uh, the the so-called standards of the... Uh, oh, sure. So they're, they're very clearly flaunting their lack of street legalness. Right. They they start coming out and most of the time is that they uh, they just kick it they just tell people to just get the hell out of the the parking area and go somewhere else. But occasionally, what they do is that they they secretly start setting up a uh, a roadblock uh. and uh, 
and then once they do that they they seal out like they force everyone to go through this roadblock and uh, test their car as quickly if like they, they they're running any uh, any um, illegal you know illegally modified uh, parts got it yeah um, in my neighborhood I live in Fruitvale now uh, we get sideshows I don't know if you ever had sideshows oh, yes. when you were in San Jose but definitely in when I used to like I used to work in uh, in East Oakland oh yeah and uh, that's where I live <laughs> yeah and that's uh, yeah like um, I uh, often you know like whenever I uh, like I would start going home from uh, in the evening I would sometimes see you know cars like uh, spin around yeah yeah I they, people like to do it relatively near my house which is fine but when I see it start, I see people start gathering on corners. I'm like, uh oh, I gotta get home fast because I don't want to get, I don't want to get stuck, like waiting for them. Right. Uh, and they get a little rowdy, and sometimes there's guns, and I don't want to yeah, be involved in that yeah, in that aspect. It's a lot worse now just because of social media. Like you know, people people want to brag in like Instagram and TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's people really gather for these. They show up real quick and then uh, but they disperse real quick after it's over um, it used to be that uh, that when people did like street racing and stuff you just did it like in a uh, basically an empty uh, industrial lot or something yeah which is what you know like my generation you know at least my generation you know what, what we did was that like uh, my, my uh, older sister used to like uh, and her uh, racing crew used to Go around like a uh, like say McCarthy Ranch for instance, uh, yeah. and uh, they would like uh, go to like you know like the, the that very long uh, strip near Dixon Landing and like just basically race there. Yeah. Yeah. These days it's all happening in like a four lane intersection, so that's where people will be doing their continuous drift. Um, so we're going to Yokohama, which means that we're basically. In racing lagoon, racing lagoon, right? <laughs> yes, that's correct. It's uh, I think I think racing lagoon is like vaguely uh, like you know it vaguely has uh, you know parts of like the Shitoko. Yeah. And, uh, Tokyo Highway battling our way over to racing lagoon. Yeah, right now we are in the Wanga, the Wangan uh, Bayshore uh, oh. Expressway. Wow. So we 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 Tokyo Highway battled, and now we're Wangan, and then we're going to be racing lagoon. We, we got the whole, we got the whole suite. Yes. <laughs> okay, we're in another god dang tunnel. So, I'm gonna let you go. Bye for now. Okay. Uh, I was just noting that we got a full moon. We're still driving. Yeah. There's a full moon out there. And uh, so, do people drive worse on a full moon out here the, the same way that they do in Oakland? So, uh, I'm not sure about that, but there, there's a lot of lore to, towards that in, like, even in, uh, even in Tokyo Extreme Racer, there's, like, a, a racer called Exhaust Eve. She's, like, one of, like, the final bosses in, uh, in the game. And, uh, the storyline is that she's, uh, she's basically just a, a regular office worker in the daytime, but when, when the full moon strikes, and she's suddenly called Exhaust Eve, and she goes around, like, hunting for, for for racers to battle, pretty much. So yes, yeah, so maybe yeah, they start driving uh, a lot more wild uh, during the full moon. <laughs> I love it. I think it's true. This is an impressive looking moon that we got up going out here. Uh, I haven't had many occasions to look at the moon in the Tokyo metro area. I guess we've left the Tokyo metro area, but but usually it's all blocked by buildings and stuff. So it's Cool to be able to see it out there. All right, I'll talk to y'all later. Bye for now. Okay, we've arrived. There aren't that many fancy automobiles here yet, but uh, w more have been arriving since we arrived. Uh, so in the meantime, we're getting some soba in the parking lot shopping center. That is a tiny little spot. We're gonna put our money in the kiosk and eat some noodles uh so yeah around what time do people usually show up so they start showing up around like 19 o'clock and uh 
like it starts getting like really populated around like uh, around 20 plus 20 to 21 o'clock and uh, that's when the cops start like you know turning the eye and it's like so figuring out if uh, if it's time to like kick out people or not cool well we got about 40 minutes to go before that occurs right. so we're gonna just check it out uh, your your car is three cylinders so in in the US we only had like the Geo and a couple other and I think Daihatsu had a three cylinder um, yeah, if I remember correctly it was like the the Geo Metro and the Daihatsu charade right and uh, yes the uh, though yeah I think like a three cylinder like nowadays like cars are trying to like go for like efficiency mm -hmm. so that they uh, there's like even Ford has like an EcoBoost uh, three cylinder for their I think uh, well they used to at least because in the uh, in America now I, I just realized now that they they're no longer selling cars except for the Mustang but they used to have it for like the like the Ford Fiesta and uh, the Ford Focus I believe as well yeah yeah uh, I've I remember there there are a few like hybrids that have the three cylinder now so I guess it's 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 come back oh it's time for her to get her soba okay we're gonna talk about how many cylinders cars have later it's soba time talk to y'all in a little while everybody's rumbling their automobiles and, and this one's rattling That doesn't sound like anything. It's a GTR. Oh, and here we got, here we got the uh, Hachiroku. Wait, no, is that an A5? It's a Trueno. Yep. Well, there are more and more people showing up, and it's uh, running low on parking spaces. There's a lot of uh, military people here. They all have skylines um, that they want to import back to the U.S. probably. I saw a guy who had a Toyota Starlet and it was crazy looking. Like he, he had the gas tank taken out because it was a racing car and so he had like a plastic gas tank just sitting in his trunk. He had all these tubes for uh, getting the exhaust that are just poking out his back window. Uh, <laughs> it was pretty, pretty tricked out. A lot of custom body work going on. It was a wild automobile. I never knew about that car before just now, uh, but he was super into it because it, 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 he got it because um, it was new when he turned 20, which must have been around 1984. So he's, uh, he's still racing out there, so that's pretty fun. Well, we saw some cool cars. There's more showing up. The cops did make an announcement at some point, but nobody seemed to mind too much. Uh, there they go. Oh, that's a, we got a Prius. <laughs> that's good. I wonder, what did he do to make his Prius sound like that? Maybe he just took the muffler off. <laughs> Remove the catalytic converter. That's what we do in my neighborhood. Oh, yeah. Not on purpose. Yes. It's the good times. Oh, there's a Civic. Yay. Okay. Well, man, I don't know how much this car talk's going to make it in there. Right. But, um, <laughs> but we talked about cars all night. Now we're going to go do something else. Bye for now. So I'm not really sure why I thought that uh, my 400 yen mic was going to be able to pick up a conversation inside of a car on the freeway with the top down, with music playing, going through tunnels. Uh, but it does not appear to have done a good job of that. There's one section that was maybe okay. Maybe that's the section on yellow here, but we recorded actually quite a lot of stuff. So I'm just going to kind of recap the night. I went out with Chibi Tech, Chibi Tech, who you may know as a chiptune composer and other composer but who is full-time at M2 and so did like the menu music for the Mega Drive Mini or, or the new tracks in OutRun 3D on the 3DS, that kind of stuff. Uh, she has a Honda S660, which is a small three-cylinder car that's pretty cool. 
and she had to work really hard to get it. And she's got like the Olympic license plates that allow you to have a white plate, even though K cars are supposed to have a yellow one. So we had a lot of deep car conversations and we were driving along the uh, Shutoko Highway of, of Highway Battle fame. And then we went on the Wangan section of Wangan Midnight uh, fame. And then we were in Yokohama at a car park, a uh, parking lot, where there were all of these other JDM cars there. And it was very Racing Lagoon. So it was like a video game the whole way through. And there was a little bit of Ridge Racer in there, just a little bit. Ridge Racer is more fictionalized. But we were hanging out in a in this parking lot, which has a waiting area that looks very much like the area that Kiryu sits in to wait in Yakuza 5 for um, opponents in his street racing endeavors. And they had like a food court there and a bunch of military jerks there. Uh, there's a lot of, it was a, it was a cool time and bizarrely felt a little video game connected, but maybe that's just cause that's how, how my brain works when I'm on the freeway, on a f- section of freeway for the for- first time. And it's like, Oh, this is familiar. This is familiar from video games. But yeah, it was a cool time. I had a good experience. Uh, Chibi Tech is cool. You should follow her on Twitter. And, um, she, she often goes there and takes pictures of the cars that she sees, especially the ones that have the, the decals. There's a special name for that that she used yesterday that I, I cannot remember what it is. But, you know, both of us are from the Bay Area. We both grew up in the same era. We both like these 90s Japanese cars. So we're just walking around looking at skylines and fair ladies and truenos and coronas and crowns and, and the, that guy that had his... Toyota Starlet, which was just wild. All kinds of good stuff. It was uh, it was nice, and it's too bad you won't get to hear most of it because it was wrecked and destroyed. But uh, I'll, I'll be hanging out today in Inokashira Park where they got the big swans, uh, the swan boats that uh, you can ride in Sailor Moon. If you remember, they would go on dates and they'd ride a swan. That's, that's Inokashira Koen. Going to hang out there with K Tall Guy of the Madman's Cafe Forums a.k.a. Keenan Alpe, who works at Unseen now, or un, is it called Unseen? Um, Ikumi's studio. So that'll be a fun little convo that we will have later. So I'll talk to y'all later. Bye for now. Okay, hello. I'm here with Keenan, a.k.a. k Guy, with whom we actually sort of worked together like 15 years ago. Yeah, it was a weird time. I was still kind of very new at this whole game thing yeah that was um the the mastiff days yeah good times um but we're here to talk about records because so messiah matsura of Mm. parappa the rapper fame Mm. he suggested that i go to the akihabara reko fan and so i went there today because i had to go as i was saying earlier i had to go back to friends to pay for the god darn video games that I had reserved because I didn't I so I, I reached my cash withdrawal limit. Oh my god. Because okay. the cash with withdrawal limit is uh Gomanen fi, uh, so fifty thousand yen. Okay, that's not which, that bad. I which mean, is like which, that high, yeah. No, but it but that's like three hundred and fifty dollars. Which is yeah not a lot of dollars. I mean the exchange rate's crazy right now. Yes. We're 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 in unprecedented not unprecedented but very Rare times. So, yes. Yeah. So uh, I went there and I purchased a bunch of records. And as has been par for the course for the entire trip, I thought I spent too much money. And then I came back and looked at my statement and I was like, oh, wow. It's like a, it's like $100 less than I thought it was. <laughs> it's a very good time to visit Japan right now. Very good time. Yeah. So I was looking at records and there and there was... Um, I guess you you may not know the the record purchasing personality, but you'll know the personality type of this person. Mm-hmm. It was there was this Ojisan who had his mask down around his chin, chin mm-hmm. uh, and he was making as much noise as possible browsing all the records. He was just going like thump 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 thump. Slap on the room. He had some sort of method that I'm not really sure what it was, where he would with full 12 inch uh, LPs, he would like pick them up and thunk them down so that they would go like thunk, thunk, thunk. But he would do it with both hands. So it would be like thunk, 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 thunk. And he was just like blaming through all of them. And mm. it was driving me crazy because I just couldn't 
I could not escape the sound of him doing it. I have part of the whole misophonia thing that I have yes. is like mm-hmm. perseverating motions and sounds, mm-hmm. especially when they're like rhythmic but slightly off. Mm-hmm. It's it's just like really tough. So I I, I put my headphones in, but um, smart smart choice. <laughs> I think I think there's a bit of a like I'm the king of the jungle with that guy. Definitely. Yes, yes. So uh, like we were talking about earlier, when you feel a loss of freedom Mm -hmm. in your life these kind of microaggressions become a way to express yourself that's right and i really felt that from this guy that he was like this is the way i'm going to assert my primacy in this domain by making as much noise as possible this is the place this is the this is my place this is my time where i can show like i'm still relevant yeah (laughs) and i was too slow for this guy and so he kept having to maneuver around me but meanwhile i was trying to maneuver around him because i didn't want to hear his noises (laughs) um and then he went started started like yeah you gotta start at the end of it and he has to start at the beginning and so yeah exactly yeah minimal yeah that's what would have been nice, but he was. It felt like he was following me around, um, <laughs> because then he went through all of the forty fives, and I was like, "There's no way he can make as much noise with the forty fives. But he found a way because he would like flip the forty fives with like a, a flick of his uh, thumb, so he'd like be like, "Bam, bam, 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 bam." Yeah, it yeah. W- <laughs> <laughs> this guy. He followed me around the whole dang place. Um, anyway, <laughs> let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about records. So. Um, uh, here I got um, Mari Hamada, mm-hmm. Love Never Turns Against. This is this is an album that I first got um, on CD uh, at a Goodwill in Torrance, California. So like wow. south of Los Angeles, where there yes. used to be a lot of Japanese people that lived there. Yes, Torrance is now not no, no more Japanese. It's kind of kind of decimated. Yes. But I just bought it on a whim because it was twenty five cents, and I loved it. Mm. She's like a she's got this hard core she can really belt out a a note like she can take a Mm -hmm. note and just like sustain it for a super long time so she's really good at rock music and that's what this is she's a rock album it's a rock album what what, do you know the year the release year oh it's like like, i I would say approximate 92 okay so it's in the 90s it's in the 90s i think we're hitting we're hitting uh yeah okay yeah Yeah. this one i don't know anything about (laughs) this one I just bought because it was cool. This is what uh, nice. Baby Baby Yumiko nice Yamashita. Oh, this one I was I actually don't know exactly what it's gonna be oh. like, but this is um, so it's it's, like, it's called uh, Aspect Special, mm-hmm. and it's got like some weird graphics on the front. This but is, yeah, this but is great. If you look at the back, it's all like cars. What I what I want this to be is uh, Gran Turismo styled music, like. When Gran Turismo starts, you have those tracks. So it's kind of, yes. kind of rock with a little bit of like kind of cheesy singing on top of it. Sort of like the extension of the Daytona Ridge Racer thing. And that would be what I'm idea. what I'm anticipating is jazz fusion, but we'll see. That that's also not bad. Uh, driving yeah. like these driving scenes to jazz fusion would be. Immaculate. Yeah, we got we got uh, things like "Sexy Road" on the yes. back here. Uh, they're different artists. It's a compilation. It's a compilation. Yeah, it's a compilation of different artists. But yeah, it's uh, I just uh, don't recognize these names. But there are some repeats. So yeah, I, I yeah I'm. Pleased. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna see what it's like. This was yeah. in the soundtrack section. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, 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 I don't know what it means because A spec is sort of a. I think that Gran Turismo A spec was a thing that was. Oh yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, so this is the first of, I think, two Oginome Yoko mm. albums that I got. But if, if if you're familiar with Oginome Yoko, she did the, um, what's it called? Is it called Dancing Hero? Repopularized recently before the city pop boom mm. by a Japanese dancing troupe. Did you see this? I do not know. So was... there, there was a Japanese dancing troupe that did a bunch of, uh, uh, well, this was the big one that they, they did, did a couple others, but... um. They did, like, everybody, it was a bunch of dancing women, and they dressed up in, like, late 80s OL oh, outfits. Yes, yes, I know this, I know this, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, they did, the, um, it's the bubble, the bubble Yeah, the bubble generation. era. It's, it's the Osaka troupe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're great. They're yeah. amazing. Yeah, they're, they're super good, yeah. and so they, they, they hit their stride and, and became viral with an Oinomi Yoko song the Do called you Dancing Hero. Dance song? Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's called Dancing Hero. I, I don't have it on here. Um, oh, this okay. this album is not that. I didn't know this title was Dancing Hero, but that's a great, yeah. 
So on, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this one is just one that I like. Let's let's skip it. <laughs> uh, this this one yeah. here we got Kaoru uh, Kohirui Maki, which Kohirui is a Maki. very unusual name. Kohirui Maki. And she has this album called um, No Problem, and it's a sample edition that, that would have been would have been sent to a radio station. That is interesting. Uh, I got it because she's wearing like an adult Girl Scout costume, yes. sort of. Yeah, I'm not really sure what it is. She's got combat boots on. Um, I'm hoping it's not. It actually sounds pretty good. It's it's like city pop esque. Okay, uh, but yeah, I'm hoping it's not like some brown shirt nationalist. Yeah, well, I, I weirdness. Mean... Sayonara no kawari ni call my name. I mean, it's it's bit a bit like love songish. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, but there's a couple jams on there. Yeah, so. sweet. Um, next we got Koji Kikawa. Mm. So I don't know if you're familiar with this guy. I've heard of his name. Yes. Yeah, he's he he was pretty famous. But I bought this album in particular, La Vie en Rose, because actually Tim sent me this album uh-huh. at some point, and La Vie en Rose. Is a particularly interesting song mm. on this self-titled album. I mean, well, not self-titled. There should be a word for when the title track ah. is the name of the album, and it's not, that's it's not, not self-titled, but self-titled it's like self-titled album. Yeah, you're yeah, right. it's, yeah, it's, it's it's like the the track name is the title of the album. Yeah, yeah. The the, the key track name, like the key single, is the title of yeah. the album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, that track is really cool because mm. it has a great saxophone section mm. but it only comes in in the last 30 seconds as the song is fading out <laughs> and i love when it's like the song has been good the whole time mm. but then it's like oh We're gonna at the end the of it level. at the end of it it's like oh it's really starting to get going and then they fade it out and they uh. leave you wanting more so it's like frustrating but also i really like it so there's, a, there's another song that does that can't recall this but yeah i totally know what you mean yeah. so i uh i also bought mm-hmm. this uh songs for jackie chan the miracle fist so, so, so this is a soundtrack to a movie called miracle fist uh, uh okay, okay. which just has just a, a bunch of 70s nonsense but i don't know it, it was it was like five dollars <laughs> i just had to do it okay so yeah, it's it's like almost like compilation of tracks. It seems there's like different films, like tracks oh. from different films on here. So these are film titles. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So it's got Dragon Fist. Yeah. So this is like Drunken Master, for example. Yeah, it's got Crazy Monkey. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I like the Miracle Fist is the name of yeah, a Miracle movie Fist. that he did. Okay, but I think this is like but it's a, a comp- compilation. Well, that's good. That's even yeah, better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's really cool. Yeah, it's called. I love the cover. Of the, so songs for Jack. Jackie Chan is very accurate. Yeah, it's got yes. it's just got him uh doing it looks like his master of cracked finger, uh, but yeah. I guess it's not. I slightly personal anecdote, but my, my wife's uh mother loves Jackie Chan, thinks he, he he was the hottest thing to her when she was younger, so it's kind of funny. There was a bit of an idol craze in Japan for Jackie Chan for some folks. Yeah, and he has the idol hair in yes. this. He's got the seventies yes. idol hair, like the uh Ken Kenji Sawada or mm. whatever uh hair. So now we've got uh, Koji. Anoji oh. Ko- Koji Kikawa, but mm-hmm. this is after he he made like a a little bit of a change to be he had to like modernize himself a couple of years later mm. to get a little more like city pop ish. Okay, okay. So he's he's got like more FM synth in here uh. and a little more guitar, and it's it's pretty good. It's definitely And it's a great yeah. album cover. It's so it's so this this album which is called Parachute God no I can't get down to Parachute the God which not so so like the oh, the, yeah. the, 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 the summer where with the where we deployed drops. the yeah, parachute yeah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Um yeah. It, it's funny how I it's funny slash embarrassing how I can't read words, but as soon as you say the words I know what the words mean. <laughs> it's you know, it's just a long Ner- long nerdy years but i will say that like this this gives me like a what was the in when, in the 80s like early 90s late 80s the not fisher the, the, those like those like are you talking about like the memphis design stuff where they had all the no i'm thinking of like those those like planners that kids would have in elementary school oh the trapper keepers yeah trapper keeper this cover gives me a trapper keeper vibe yeah for sure yeah it, i mean cuz he's 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 got Oh, an all-white suit. Yes. He's got shoulder pads. He's got a blue 
guitar. Yes. And then there's a, he's against this pink background, and he's got a friggin' Sony PVM monitor. Yes. Like the it, and it's like the five inch version. Yes, yes, it's definitely of the time. And but it's it's like the only other thing in the photograph. Yeah. It it I love it. Yeah, it's, it's great. Yeah, Team Bob, Team Bob, almost yeah. So nice. we got here. We got uh, Akichi Yazawa. Um, this I bought because it really gave me a city pop vibe. It's him sitting on like a bar a, stool. a bar stool in a fictional skyscraper, I believe, because mm. I think that everything behind him is very is, blue screen. Is, is very blue, blue screen, screen. <laughs> but uh, but it's got this cool thing where the sleeve has a cutout mm. of an E. And uh, and you see him through that, and I think that's that's what really drew me to this particular album. This here. is in great condition too. Yeah, it uh, it looks really nice, and I like the uh, the font on the back, which mm. is very reminiscent of. Oh God, I'm blanking on the name of the guy who did the um, Duran Duran covers, uh, but it's like that font that he used. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Ball and Chain is. Uh... Is one of the songs on here. I want to hear about that. It's really good. This is also some FM synthy funky stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because I listened to this album on my phone, oh yeah, I meant to mention this. It's not like I know who all these people are. Some of them I know who they are, mm. uh, like Ogino Miyoko and um, Koji uh, Kikawa. Mm-hmm. I know them, but uh, a lot of these, what I was doing since I had the time today, is I, you know, I've got a data plan to escape this annoying. Oji-san, who's making all these thonking noises, I'm going to put in my Bluetooth headset and just play every album that looks interesting you're just, on YouTube. You're just YouTubing it, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. that's smart. And there is honestly, like, I know City Pop is booming and all that, but there's a lot of great music from the era that was lost here and that people, you know, people here, uh, they do recognize. Like, you go to Koenji, you go to some of these areas, and there's just a lot of these stores where people are looking through this stuff. So it's nice... It's nice that you can listen to it on YouTube and kind of get a feel for it, but there's yeah. a lot of hidden stuff out there. Honestly. Yeah, there's there's like one of the things we'll get to later. There was mm. there's like only one thing that you can find pretty much period to listen mm. to. Mm. Um, and actually, there was a show that I wanted to go to last night, but I was busy being in Yokohama looking at cars, mm-hmm. which is called something like it was called something like Diggin CDs, and it was actually just like three blocks away, and it's multiple DJs who go through 90s CDs from Japan and Hong Kong and mm. find like cool deep cuts which is exactly what I do mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so I was really interested in seeing it but it was just bad timing yeah so here's another Akichi Yazawa mm-hmm. which I got because I liked that other one this is a uh, Seiko Matsuda, Seiko Matsuda okay. and yeah, yeah, I like Seiko. I like her because she's got this song called Aquarius mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. on uh, her album that I don't remember what it's called, but it's it's red. And it just has awesome synthesizer yeah. sounds that are not, it's not like FM synth. Mm-hmm. It's like a different, I, I don't know how to describe it, but yeah. it's it's got like a breathiness to it. And it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's really cool. Well, so. Masada Seiko's great. Yeah she's, yeah. she's she's definitely like when you turn on TV in Japan, you... you She's like definitely on those top tens. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. She's she's a popular lady. Mm-hmm. Uh, here's another mm-hmm. Koji Kikawa. Uh, where yeah, he... and this is almost visual chaos. Yeah, his here. his the what what this uh, this cover is giving me aside from the like the cool cut ins uh-huh, and things uh-huh. like it sucks that nobody can see this. Um, but the 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 album's called Innocent Sky. If you want to follow along yeah, at home, you should look up the cover. Um, it's great. The but the cover is also giving me. He did the song called Berserker, and um, he's a uh, he's a British artist that I like a lot. Whose name Berserker. I'm friggin' blanking on. Um, he's a pretty famous guy. Ayumi Nakamura. Mm. I just got this because uh, it was cheap. But I always liked the her band name, Ayumi Nakamura and the Midnight Kids. I mm. just thought that was that was cool. And in Initial D, wasn't one of the teams the midnight kids uh, i think maybe yeah. yeah yeah um but i I listened to a couple tracks it sounded good yeah all of the titles are in english too it's very uh, yeah very yeah. nice ami ozaki i got this uh what is it air kiss album mm. because just look those i mean these are colors that i like i also found it interesting that all of the session musicians are westerners yes yes this the back of this, so this is the air kiss. The back of this gives me like a, 
like a nineties encyclopedia software. Oh, that. absolutely. This is this is like a CDI software yes. looking. Yes, but her picture is great. Like she's like covered with like a, 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 her comforter that exploded. Like I had this. This happened to me uh, about a year ago. I, I tried to wash my down com- or dry my down comforter in a um, in a laundromat here, and I, I stuffed it in. It was too big and it ripped, and literally the down flew all over the laundromat, and uh, it took me and my wife uh, about like four hours, and then we had to <laughs> we had to like like call Muji and find like a store that had a down comforter because it was like it was like actually I think at the dead of winter, like maybe like. December 30th. And so uh, that was like our only down. It was like a disaster. But yeah, yeah that's what this cover reminds me of. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's the real deal right it was, there. It was, uh, it was memorable. Um, here we got Nakamoto Yuma. Uh, uh, Yuma is also an unusual name, I would say. Yuma? Uh, I don't actually know Yuma. Yeah. Oh, you do? I do. Yeah. Maybe it's not as unusual as I thought. Yeah. Uh, she's got um, a weird bunch of stuff on her head. There's this theory that. Um, Kurt Feldman, who's our composer, hmm. has has proposed, which uh, he he calls the the funky hat theory, which okay. is basically that if there's an album between like 1984 and 1987, and the the lady on the cover is wearing a funky hat, mm-hmm. that it's got like a like an 80 percent chance to be extremely good. Well, this is an 88 album, so it falls outside that uh, spectrum. It's outside the box. But, um... The fact that she, her gloves are, yeah, all... she's 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 basically got like kitchen yeah yellow it looks gloves. Like she's ready to to do some dishes in like a, a like a high pressure uh, water situation. But hmm, that uh pamu pamu cat yes. pamu pamu uh, lady would is that what yeah mm-hmm. yeah cat pamu pamu but she she would she would uh, enjoy this yeah. uh, this look I, and and this this. Her necklace and her things on this, uh, the album name is, how would you pronounce this? Gatine? No, oh, no, it's 18. 18. It's, it's, oh, it's blocked. <laughs> it's blocked. I'm so sorry. It's blocked by it's the 18, OB. 18, yes. It's called 18. Yeah. So, so th- this stuff that are, that is like pasted to the front of her dress, it's very arts and crafts. Like, yeah. she has a, she has a die, like a, like a dice die, like as, like on a ring on yeah. one of her, it's very, it's very it's crafty for sure. <laughs> it's crafty. So now here's 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 a really cool one. All right. So this is Mariko with Q with cutie. No, sorry, Mariko with cute. Mariko with cute. I O E. It's uh, Ice Age. Ice Age. Oh, Ice Age. Yeah, it's Ice Age. Um, and it's got a bunch of gems on the front. So this album is. I this is actually the most expensive album I bought. It was. Uh, tw- it's also a sample. Tw- yeah, it's also a sample. It's twenty four eighty yen. Uh, which it turns out is like eighteen dollars, <laughs> mm. but um, this is very interesting because this is the only album they released, uh, wow. and they released one single as well. And so this is the one where, like, I I found the one YouTube video that exists. Uh, only two thousand people have viewed it, but it, it like I as soon as I listened to it, I was like, wow, this is this is something special and different. And so because it's a sample. And was sent to radio. You can see on the back here that it comes with this uh, uh, little poster thing that yes. says "new single debut." That's an advertisement, um, essentially. So that's an advertisement for the, the one single session. they had. Mm-hmm. Which, which now I feel like now that I have the one album, I should get the one single because it'll have one extra song for me because the B side will be different. Right, right. Um, but it's it's really interesting music because it's closer to synth pop than city pop or idol pop or whatever it's it's a proper band and they have like a weird warbly vibe that is cool and different for the era it almost reminds me of um jun togawa like if jun mm. togawa was a, were a better singer um mm. it's kind of, and, and we're more serious about making pop music mm. uh i mean jun to- togawa is all about subverting it but, but um so so this mariko with cute do, do we know what her name is like do you think her name is mariko something i okay. forgot i forgot yeah. what her last name is i'm like, curious if she, had a, a if she had a career outside of this album as far as i know she did not okay. like mm. the, the this is the thing that she did mm. 
Okay, yeah. So that's this is definitely one of the ones that I'm most excited yeah. about because it's an unusual one. Also, even the obi is weird. It's really yeah. skinny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the fact that like you misread Ice Age yes. because it it it's the, like a misprint. The C is an O for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, it's hundred yeah. percent an O. But in the but in the cover, but it's in the cover, it's a C. it's correct. Yeah. So there's definitely yeah. Uh, it's it's. It's definitely like a bit of a like they're just starting out. Feeling. Yeah, it's and it's clear. and and it's on Invitation Records, which is not super yeah, familiar yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm this this one is like super cool. I'm gonna yeah. sh- I'm gonna show you this later. Uh, the 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 one song that mm-hmm. we have. So here we got Raspberry Wind. That's mm-hmm. another um, Okinomi Yoko album, mm-hmm. and I feel like this album is actually super underrated in terms of the city pop scene mm. because people don't really think about her in the city pop arena because mm. she's more of an idol singer. Mm, but yes, she yes. she has at least two albums that are very much like in that funkier vibe and Raspberry Wind is definitely one of them and it's super underrated album, so check that one out. Oh uh, yeah, it looks great. Yeah, I love the I love the, the atmosphere of her on the cover too. Absolutely. Yeah. Um now this one this is uh Mariko Tone. Mariko Tone. Mm. Uh, Purple Rose. The first track. This is another sample, not for sale album. Uh-huh. Uh, and so we got a little, little, little yeah. poster of her. Mm-hmm. Um, the it says Mariko Times. It's like a fake newspaper. <laughs> uh, the first track on this album is just like is like unbeatable in huh. terms of if you like that hardcore tunes kind of like big bass synthy uh, stuff yeah. from that era the real funk yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's really good and uh this album was uh 1480 which is like i don't know like 11 bucks at this point oh. but uh it as you can see it's got damage yeah, a little damage it's got damage on it it, it has a, a bunch of like messed up spots on yeah. the cover but the disc is fine and sure. so like I'm very happy to get this for this price because yeah. this is like one of those albums that that first track actually does show up on a lot of people's like like Americans city pop compilations. Huh. And so this is one of those albums that is eventually going to be like a hundred bucks. Sure. <laughs> so I, I, I love this tagline. It's like um, basically like to translate it. It's basically like you're going to fall in love more quickly now with more professional women. It's almost like a like yeah. this, yori professional onae ima. I saw yori professional onae is like for women looking at this. Like you need to be more and more like a professional. So it's it's very it's like that eighties like we're coming out in the world. Yeah, feeling. and then like ima toki made the kasokusuru like you are like. You you you're going to be falling in love even faster now as you come out as a professional one. So yeah. very of the era. It's yeah, cool. it's totally of that bubble. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's like in that eighty five. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. really cool. Uh, that era, that bubble era, man. Like, I've watched some documentaries on that recently, but it's it's crazy how people thought about money in that era and mm. like how it felt. It felt like you could just do anything in that era. And I think like that, like Morning Miss Me as well, like at that time, the songs that were singing were really like, yeah, Japan's like coming out and they're coming mm-hmm. out in the world and doing great things. And you don't get that as much this, like in the tw- you know, 2020 season yeah. where we are right now. There's that energy kind of dissipated. But at that time, it was just exploding. Like people were like, we're taking over the world. That was the yeah. mentality then, right? I was surprised, in fact, that mm. Yakuza Zero... Huh. managed to truly like evoke that feeling mm. and it, it was yeah. clearly not like Kiryu and Majima were not experiencing that yes. but you could see everything around them and the the conversations that were having around mm. that were happening around them yep. people were experiencing that and feeling yeah. that way and it, i don't know it's, it's 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 neat to think about that era yeah. in retrospect and experience it through media because and then come here yeah to Japan, where like the remnants are here yeah. to some extent, but they're but a lot of it has been hidden, and like yeah. it's also like I was in this shop mm. browsing for records. Yeah. I only saw one other foreign person. Mm-hmm. Like nobody was trying to get this stuff, which is kind of weird because uh, I was at a a record swap, like a foreign mm-hmm. record swap in Oakland, 
um, like a month and a half ago. I think I talked about it on the podcast, actually. Mm -hmm. And it was so depressing (laughs) because everything was so expensive. And like there was somebody who specialized in City Pop and the record started at $100. Yeah, 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 yeah. And like I heard overheard conversations between people where they were like, oh, you got that? That's cool. What are you going to charge for it? And they're like, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to make it up on shipping. (laughs) Because when you look at Discogs these days, uh, you can find a record that is like desirable, but at a decent price. And then the shipping is like $50. Right, right, right. Well, that's how they bump it up, right? Yeah. yeah. But of course, like, it's actually going to be shipped to media mail and it's going to cost $3. Of course. So it's the way. Yeah. But Regarding Yakuza 0, um, which I need to finish, but that game, when you beat up enemies, money flies out of them, right? That oh, yeah. Really, it's really evocative of that. Like, like you look at, like, speaking of that, that dance trip, the Osaka dance trip that was doing that, um, the uh, the bubble dance. Uh, what, yeah. What was that song? Dancing Hero? Dancing Hero. Right. Like, in those days, like, people would, like, flash, like... Like like three uh, ma- ma- Ichimayan uh, bills, like uh, $10,000 yen bills to taxis to try to get them to stop. Right, because right. Because that was like how fluid, how much money people had on them. And so it, it's, yeah, I guess I, that, that game really did a good job of showing mm-hmm. the point, like yeah, that, that moment. It was also, I, I also sometimes think about how like kind of retroactively in history as I think about this stuff, um... I didn't know about the bubble era when I was growing up. Of course, yeah. yeah. But but then um, when Final Fantasy VII came out, mm-hmm. I heard about in the American news how it was huge and it, and it was like a resurgence of economy for Japan. Hmm. I still hear Japanese developers talk about like 1997 or whatever as a year when games really sold well and they wished that they could go back to that time or whatever because it was like some of those people had lived through the tail end of the bubble era as children or teens or whatever but then they got into this kind of like more of a recession era yeah and then final fantasy 7 was like doing gangbusters and it made the playstation come up and all these other games were coming up with it and they were feeling like Oh, this is bubble era for me now. Yeah, there's some euphoria there, and yeah, like I, it's very, it's very similar. Like when I graduated from college in 2005, like I, I, I came out uh, of college and got a job, and then right after that, the recession hit. Yeah, and I was, I just, just missed it, right? So, like, it's a lot of reminiscing of old eras in Japan. Like, yeah, and I think that's that's equal for a lot of places, but. Especially, like, the relevancy of these games in Japan. You know, console gaming in Japan is kind of a... It's a, it's a minor hobby. Uh, excuse me. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a normal thing. People are all on their phones. Yeah. So yeah. that era of, like, wanting to make something, you know, that says something that is artistic for uh, game creators in Japan, it's, it's sort of a bygone era in a way. Mm-hmm. And uh, people are still trying to figure that out. But in, inevitably, that stuff has to look outside Japan to sell. Uh, to, how do we make it sell outside Japan? And then inevitably, that changes the calculus of like, oh, what do we? You know, we, they, they they're not looking as inward as they were, and so it's a it's a it's a different era. And it, sometimes I like to think about like going back there. Would it be better or not? I don't know, but it was definitely um, a different time, and like different calculus than today. Yeah, certainly different. It's been interesting to watch the cycles of the Japanese industry as regards that stuff. I've talked about this a little bit before, but like there that realization really hit in the like PS3, Xbox 360 era yeah. when Japanese companies were like, okay, we have to if we're making console games, we have to aim them toward the west and so they tried to like partner with western companies. Yeah. They tried to make games that would appeal to westerners yeah. based on their ideas from here and none of those things worked at all and i love those failed experiments and i think they're They're fantastic and interesting interesting. but they definitely were failures and uh and they only started to succeed when they ignored that stuff and were like let's just make good games that we would like and then 
American that will localize it and see if Americans like it. And which obviously works better because Americans tend to like, like console players Mm -hmm. tend to like Japanese video games that are made for Japan, but localized intelligently for America. Yeah. Um, the, the funny thing, though, is that the, those those Japanese games made by Japanese developers that are, they're sort of made with the Japanese sensibilities. Um, they don't sell in Japan. <laughs> right. No, much. they don't. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's like, ultimately, they figured out the formula, which is just make games for, for us in Japan. Mm-hmm. It won't sell here. Mm-hmm. But that's that's how you make a game yeah. that will you, succeed you, in the you, West. You 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 are true to your legacy. You don't you don't try to I don't know. You don't you don't try to make your your experience tailor made to the West. You 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 rely on your sensibilities that you've relied on. But yeah, as you said, you localize it and you just bring it to the audience at the right timing and like with the right marketing. I think. That helps. I there like I I've talked with friends, um, people here that I've met that they're like, man, I really want to play more Japanese video games, but everybody's so focused on mobile games, I end up playing more Western games, and now Western games are are interesting enough that I'm interested yeah. compared to before. And I think that just the 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 balance has really shifted. Um, I'm hoping that. Um, you know, now the yen is weak. Of who knows how long it'll be, uh, but it, it, I'm hoping that Sony and uh, some of the other Japanese companies can can build enough stuff that like Japanese audiences can take uh, like pay more attention to them. It's a it's a difficult market in Japan though. People just they don't buy consoles here as much as they used to. Switch Switch yeah. is a good Switch Switch is a uh, exception. They they are buying the Switch, so there are interesting games on the Switch for Japanese market, uh, but. It's just a, it's a different, it's a different market than it was 10 years ago. So, yeah, totally. Um, um, is, is it okay to mention that you work yeah. for Unseen? I do. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Keenan's working with Ikumi Nakamura. Ikumi Nakamura's yeah. studio Unseen, which is making large, larger-ish scale games for, yeah. in, in Japan yes. with, uh, with a diverse team that's not only, Japanese people so it is it is an interesting perspective to be thinking about this stuff and I've I've worked obviously with uh Japanese companies and 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 thought a lot about these kinds of things I don't know it's it it's a weird time like I've seen like retro game youtuber twitter people who have started playing more western games Mm -hmm. uh and they're just like I love watching Japanese game players be fascinated by like Western NES games or something like that. Like that's, yeah. it's really interesting for to be like, look at this Western version of this game, or yeah. look at this Western game that came out that's really good that came from the Famicom era that yeah. I really loved. People that do love consoles here yeah. that are still into it are yeah. having to look further and deeper than they did before yes. because. Mm-hmm. Few, there are fewer games being made in Japan yes. uh, for them, but at the same time, like there are at this, it, it also kind of feels like Japan is having a AAA renaissance as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. to a degree, it, for the last few years, like yeah. we we got our Souls likes, we got our Yakuza, like yeah. Sega. Um, I was talking with some other folks about how like it's maybe one of the best times ever to be a Sega fan because mm-hmm. there's so many actual sega games coming out that's true that's true and and it's true that a lot of japanese companies like capcom and um ben and emco they're putting out and and they're putting out a lot of great games it's just tough i think like it's very difficult in these big um studios and these big companies to put these games together in an efficient way uh, um yeah like I've worked at a few different Japanese companies and the efficiency is uh, challenging. Like I, I mean, I've worked at Western studios as well and it's, there's always problems. Uh, big, big studios, there's always going to be inefficiencies, but I was kind of shocked at how the cap, like why in a huge Japanese company, when you look at a project or when you look at um, a, a team doing work, like judging that team, whether that team moves forward or continues working on something or not. Uh, I, I, I was not in the high level discussions of like how this works, but from outside looking in, I was often kind of a confused, like, okay, like 
it doesn't make sense to run this thing. Do you see a viable product here? Like how much do you invest in something to see if it's going to bear fruit before uh, you cut it? And then like, and also within the company itself, like how does the political calculus, like what benefits you there? There's all sorts of, it's a very jumbled together, mm -hmm. uh, at least in my experience working at uh, Japanese studios. So I was really, sh I was really shocked at like how far, like thinking about making a good game and like making a game that would make people excited often is like kind of really, really lower in the, in the time yeah. and in, in, in your think, in your thought process. And a lot of it is like, how can I figure out to how to get myself in a good position where I am at? And, yeah. And like, I yeah, mean, how can I get that window seat? Human nature, right? Of course. But I think the incentives, like creating companies that create incentives for people to do good work is really important. And like, uh, you know, Unseen, um, I think, as I mentioned to you before, like I joining Unseen was something I didn't expect. And mm -hmm. I didn't know Nakamura Ikumi very well or anything before I joined. I did, but, but talking with her, you know, she wants to make not only a game. Uh, it's starting to sound like an advertisement. I'm sorry. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, it, she doesn't. She she wants to make a game that people love. That's great. But she also wants to make a place where people can come together and 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 actually have a adult discussion about what is a good game and like what what do we want to make together as artists, right? I think that that was like really neat. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's not. It it may sound a little bit like an ad, but it <laughs> at the same time like. When she's doing, like, a video about how they have, like, feminine hygiene products in their bathroom. Yeah. Like, that's, to me, that's cool. And that's, like, something that everyone should have. Yes. But the fact that she is prioritizing making a video of it <laughs> to show yeah. that, like, this is important. Yeah. And we are here in this industry. Because, like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it isn't fantastic for women in the game industry Absolutely in Japan, not. and so for her to be to to make that video is actually like a political statement, <laughs> and yeah, so yeah. it's I think it's yeah. I think it's good. I I appreciate it. Well, well, from her, I think, and and I I can't really speak for her, but for her, it's just like how can I make the people that work at my studio more comfortable? Yeah. And, and women, as you said, I've worked at Japanese, other Japanese studios. There are a lot of women at those Japanese studios. And it's not like they are not well taken care of per se, but you know, there's a lot of like, because she is a female CEO, because she is, has that perspective working at uh, Capcom and uh, at uh, Tango Gameworks for many many years she she's worked in so many environment and in, in many environments that were not really thought from that perspective and that's you know it, it all comes down to it's the same as any uh in politics right like if you don't have a female perspective at a high level you you th those things don't don't filter down yeah um so her putting that statement out is very important because it just shows that we uh as a studio care about female artists who work with us yeah we, we in the end we have to make a game and like on a human level yes. not not just like yes. a not like a lip service level it's Absolutely. like yeah. it's it's like a physically we care about you <laughs> yes 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 yeah and and like that in the end right like we need to make a game that is going to appeal to people all over the world that's that that is going to get people excited and by by pre creating an environment where the people at the company can work effectively, then we're going to be way better at doing that, right? So yeah, of course. That's, like that's, it all feed it all feeds into each other, right? So, yeah. If yeah. people feel safe, yes, they can be more creative. Uh, yes, like that's uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna keep going with yes, these yes, records. Yes. Oh my gosh. We'll, we'll finish them up. What are you showing me? Uh, we got. Let's see. <laughs> we got uh, Akira Inoue, who who does a lot of oh, um story. jazz fusion stuff. He's he's got one of those little mustaches. Windy wow. Story is, a, is some sort of a movie. I have no idea. I actually bought it because of him. Um, it's it's some sort of like riding hero looking motorcycle movie. And and it's his, his the band that he's working with is calling called Unit 451 Degrees Fahrenheit. That's so. amazing. That's a great title. Yeah. Of, he's going to burn I, some books. So, so my, this movie, so it's called Windy Story here, but my, my guess is that it has a different 
title wherever it comes from because Probably. it's it's a bunch of um, non Japanese people like yeah. uh, Caucasians on the cover, right? So I really wonder. I wh- I'm assuming that it's a movie that has a different name in the West yes. and different soundtrack also. Uh, I'm assuming that that he did the soundtrack for the Japanese version. That could be true. It's hard to say looking at this, but that could definitely be true. Yeah, we got we got to figure it out later. Yeah. I'm, I'm not really sure. I don't know any examples of western films that had their soundtracks replaced for the Japanese audience. Yeah, I mean, but like Sonic CD had its western oh, soundtrack true. replaced. That's so. absolutely true. Yeah. But there there is one Japanese person in the cast, so it's okay, possible okay. that it's uh, so we'll, maybe we'll it see. is a Japanese film. We have yeah. to look it up. Yeah, we'll but have unit to look it up. 451 Fahrenheit is a, is That's a great name. Great name. Yeah. Uh so now we got my yeah. man Toshinobu Kubota, Toshinobu. Uh, Kubota yeah. and yeah. he is He's a little um, fast and loose with his um, relationship with with race, I would say. Oh. But um, but he's he's got those funky jams, and I love he's got this friggin' tombstone uh, sticker yes. on the cover of his I album. I and I've I have another album of his that has um, it's got like a visual art book, and it's all like. It's all like cow skulls and weird artwork and stuff. And so he's like some kind of a weird like funk goth. Uh I love his music. Uh he's he's just he's just a weird he's a weird guy, but I got to get all of his uh, stuff. I can't I can't. Great, it, it, this this look though. There there are a few other I can't recall the name, but there are a few other Japanese artists that have this look. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's, it's sort of a Maybe the the the, uh, the uh, charitable interpretation is it's an homage, right? Yeah. Well, I think his look isn't the problem because he he definitely is a tan guy, yes. and that's okay. Like yes. I think he's actually like from southern Japan, okay. and stuff. But it's more like the appropriation of sounds I that see. he does. I see. That's I see. that's the problem, I see. and and. He'll, he's got some songs that have some questionable titles I see. to them and things, but his his uh, it, not on this album. I see. Uh, okay. But he's 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 got he's got some ones um, where he's just talking about like and black people do this. <laughs> like, well, okay, so there you go. All right, next we got Sky Native. This is now and Nobu, uh, which is like I did not know what this is, but it's some like jazz fusion stuff. It's it's one of those like when you see a when you see a Japanese album that has like th- this is my theory like not not um okay. my my musician Kurt Feldman's theory but when you get a Japanese album that has a rectangle inside of the squarish cover uh, 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 when you've got a rectangle inside and then you've got like a a, a nice um really sharp font Yes. Then the likelihood of that being good jazz fusion is very high <laughs> to me. Correlation is not causation, but yeah. yes, probably. Yeah. Right. It's, I like the blue sky. It's very, yeah. And then we got this uh, Kazumi, I don't, I can't Chika. read his, Tochka. his, his uh, Tochka is the name of the album, um, um, but uh, Kazumi something. Watanabe Kazumi. Yeah, wa, oh, yeah okay, Watanabe. Uh, this is another good jazz fusion album, it's, he's, it's all yellow, it's yeah. not, not, not that exciting. I, I, I like, I like, I like, I like the yellow, it's very evocative. Yeah, it's yellow. Um... I got another Mari Hamada. She's the the rock musician I mentioned earlier. Mm. Uh, this oh, right, album right, right. is mm-hmm. Rainbow Dream. She's still going, by the way. She's still doing it. She like at some point sort of transitioned into being like a power metal singer. Oh wow! Uh, which really works. Says, she has a belt buckle that says Picasso on it, as she should. <laughs> I think that's important, and it's kind of got a um, pro wrestler shape. Mm. Uh, like the 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 actual leather of the belt. That's true. As a, yeah. a pro wrestling shape. And then the last album that awesome. we got here is the, the Last, last Dragon, Dragon soundtrack, oh, which man. is extremely good. If you've never seen this movie, um, it's about a a guy who becomes very good at martial arts and has to beat up a bunch of people and wears the Bruce Lee yellow yeah, yeah. yellow album a uh, yellow outfit with a white uh, black stripe. Um, and it's it's like all of the martial arts in it is in, is incredibly dubious. Okay. But uh, it's fun watching this very earnest actor do his thing, and the main theme song is fantastic. So just seeing it 
here in Japan for five bucks. Yeah. I was like, oh, I gotta get it. There's a Stevie Wonder track on here. Yeah, there's there's no way that this album would be five dollars in America. That is true. It's um, a Motown record. Yeah. Uh, Star. It's, it's got it's got Rockwell's Peeping Tom. I'm I'm a big fan of Rockwell. Uh, Rockwell was like friends with the Jacksons. Uh huh. Um, and so like Michael Jackson did a duet with him. Uh, there was a song called like Somebody's Watching Me. Mm. Uh, and a lot of people thought it was just a Michael Jackson song, but it's a duet with Rockwell. Uh. But weirdly, Rockwell has a lot of songs about voyeurism. So we got Peeping Tom, we got Somebody's Watching Me, and there's at least one other. Uh, and he only has two albums. So it's kind of weird to have oh, to spend that. that much time on like the idea of, of watching somebody that you're not supposed to. <laughs> it's I mean, like, there's, there's, oh yeah, he's, he's got a song about, um, <laughs> about a stalker, but that uh, he likes it. Right, right. Um, how he has a stalker, but it's fine. Yes, yes, that's a... Uh... That, that seems like an 80s, 90s. Actually, wait, maybe that's the song Peeping Tom. Maybe, maybe but, uh, well, anyway. But, yeah, I, I I guess this was shot in California. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, I like the uh, uh, the traditional uh, Chinese coat, right? The, the button down. Oh, yeah. yeah it's, oh, you should watch this movie. Uh, it's um it's bad, but it's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as, as they are. But it looks, uh, the, 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 the soul blow is uh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. Very nice. Yep. Okay, well, we've looked through all my records, and uh, now we've kept you on here for about, like, five million hours. Um, so <laughs> I guess we should stop talking about records. I'm going to buy some more records. I'm going to buy some more video games. I'm not going to tell you about all of them. But tomorrow, uh, I'm going to talk about the video games a little bit because I uh, I know that people want to hear it. So yes. we're going to do it. We're going to talk about it. I want to hear about it. Okay. Well, we'll do it. Um, well, thanks for talking for a while. No problem, man. Nice to, nice to see you. It's been a, quite a few years since we chatted. It has been, and I don't think we've ever hung out in Japan before, right? I feel like we have, but it was like a very limited amounts of time. Oh, okay. I definitely hung out with Tim, and like he took me to the tomato ramen place. That tomato ramen place, it's I cool. think that it's not vegetarian anymore. Ah. And so we we can no longer. They used to not put chicken in the stock, mm. and then they changed it. So they they have like a they had a tomato ramen where you could hold the chicken, and, and then it was vegetarian. It you can still hold the chicken, but they the have broth. now ah. put chicken in the broth where it wasn't before. Well, so Tim and I always used to go to Yummy Yummy Curry, which is over here in Nakano, like just a few blocks away from where I am right now, mm. and um. They had a vegetarian ramen for like 10 years. And then at some point they stopped doing it and didn't tell anybody. It was still the veggie, the veggie curry, but they, they started putting shrimp in it. And, um, Tim didn't actually realize it until I went and was like, you know, the last couple of times I ate here, it made me feel sick. And he's like, well, that's weird. And so then I decided to actually ask them, like, is this still vegetarian? Like, do you have like, fish or shrimp or whatever and they're like oh there's shrimp in it now we started doing that like two years ago i was like that's exactly when i started getting sick eating this yeah. and so uh but now like because tim and i used to t i don't know okay this is, this is putting too much importance on us i don't know if it's because <laughs> tim and i used to talk about it all the time but the last time i went there mm -hmm. when i asked about the vegetarian curry they were so like annoyed and dismissive like of me mm -hmm. um which is unusual for a japanese business to be sure. like directly hostile but it was really like get out of my store kind of a vibe uh oh. what the way they were saying no like what i was like do you still have that do you have that vegetarian curry again and they're like no just like no mm. and i was like w could could it be and they're like no it's impossible and then she like turned away from me and walked away oh. so like i i feel like i got the vibe that like a lot of people had asked for it. Yeah, I mean, and, that's probably... And best. probably a lot of Caucasian people specifically, yeah. which feels like probably it's Tim's and my fault. <laughs> I mean, there's you know, a lot of non-Japanese people living in of course. Nakano and of course. in Tokyo in general nowadays. Um, and I personally am not vegetarian, so... But I can, to I can totally see... 
like as a vegetarian or or a vegan um, living in Japan can be very difficult, right? So yeah. it really limits you, and so you have to. I, I'm assuming that the waitress and the business gets a lot of requests for this thing, and who knows, like. You would think that, okay. Like, if they get enough requests, why right. wouldn't they just still do it? Yeah, exactly, right? And and who knows? Like, it could be logistical. It could be ingredient. Who knows? It, there's, like, so many reasons. But I do think there are vegan, vegetarian options. Like, we order some um, groceries online, and we can get all sorts of vegan, vegetarian options if we, if we want it. Um, but it can be difficult. Is Japanese uh, populace in general is not like super receptive to that stuff. Yeah, I mean, we were just in the in the Lawson and the Family Mart trying to find a snack that didn't have meat in it, yeah. and it, and it's like, it I mean, I've talked about this a million times, but like for real, the plain potato chips have chicken extract, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it's it's like why? Oh, the bullion. <laughs> just it's, like yeah. you don't you don't you do not need it. Yeah. All you need is a potato and salt. Yeah. Like that's that's a good chip. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. can just eat that. And, it's okay. I agree. It can be really difficult here uh, if you are trying to avoid meat. So mm. yep. But but Tokyo, luckily, it's a big place, and there are enough. I yeah. feel like there's enough of an audience here that you can find it if you, especially if you're living here. If it, it's tough, like if you're trying to, if you're in a spot and you're trying to find something like at the, at the moment. It can yeah, be yeah, it, yeah. Right? Well, and and that's part of why I'm staying in Nakano because yeah. like I know where I can eat for sure, mm-hmm. and so it's like I'm actually having in a way an easier time this trip because mm-hmm. I'm not trying to eat everywhere. Yeah, I'm planning my outings around okay, a place where I can eat opens at this time. Mm-hmm. I'm going to leave after that yeah, 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 <laughs> because yeah, yeah. like then I have a meal and then I'm solid for like X number of hours. Mm-hmm. And then as long as I get back home before 8 p.m., mm-hmm. I can eat another meal mm-hmm. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. I yep. mean, it, you know, and, and you know, you're meeting with people who are understanding and, and cool. So they'll work with you as, as needed. So, but it's, it's good. I mean, honestly, like, if you can you can find the stuff that works with you here if you if you look you can find it so i'm glad it's good to it's good that you're here and that you're enjoying yourself while you're here so. yeah there's 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 good stuff out there you just got to find it yeah, look. check out that happy cow website if i could remember what my login was then i could have it on my phone but i got it on can yeah happy cow happy cow is a really good um website website slash app um you have to pay for the app it's like five dollars but you can find vegetarian veg oh. veg friendly grocery stores mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and vegan places and basically all over the world and it's all supplied by the the user base oh, so awesome. it's it's really good so there's reviews and there's like you know like this they have five things here or they have one yeah. thing here or whatever and it's uh it's really handy and i yeah. use it all the time in japan specifically yeah. <laughs> because it otherwise it, it gets kind of hard to find yeah it can be tricky yeah okay well it's been a long it's been a long run so i'm gonna let y'all go i'll talk to y'all later nice chatting with you all yes thank you thank you for being here keenan yeah, nice uh, seeing you. yes indeed i'll talk i'll talk to y'all later bye for now I don't know if this is weird to talk about, but I was thinking as I was doing all these little vignettes and stuff and hanging out and talking about things, it's, uh, I'm glad I got to talk to Keenan. I do miss having Tim here. Like, talking to Keenan kind of reminded me of that because it's nice to be out here talking to someone else for whom Japan is not, like, a new, exciting, weird thing. This is where it's kind of, like, strange to talk about, but... I feel like so much of the Westerner in Japan talk that you get is like people being here for the first time and being like, isn't this crazy? And I feel like everybody listening to this, all you people out there are intelligent folks. You know that this is a regular place. It's just a country. There's a bunch of people who just live here. Uh, In fact, the majority of the people (laughs) just live here. It's not like crazy or wacky to them. It is their normal human lives. And it's nice to have a conversation with someone else who 
not only understands that, but also understands the ways in which it's different from the U.S. or defies the expectation of an intelligent audience that doesn't live here, etc. Um, it would be nice if Tim could be here as well, doing his own thing. I was a little worried about how this episode was going to go with just me talking, and I, I really do think that it, it it helps to have someone else like Keenan's lived here for several years. It's it's nice to have someone else who, while they may not know the same things or, or have the same focus, um, has been here and understands this as just a place. Like, it really is tiring to see people be like, do you know that they drive on the left <laughs> or whatever? It's like, it's just they're looking for things to be surprised by. And it ruins the ability for someone who actually has been here a bunch and kind of appreciates the place to be surprised by things. You know, like, I like being surprised by finding a band that I didn't know about, uh, or by finding a game that went under the wire, or um, by finding out a new thing about a park, or um, about driving with Chibi Tech the other day. Like, it's nice to just have these kinds of little moments of realization and connecting the dots and stuff rather than some loud brash ridiculousness about or trying to blow up japan as a as a strange wacky place when it's really just a regular place with a little bit of wackiness but we all got a little bit of wackiness imagine if you did not live where you lived and then uh, you you came there and it was like uh, everybody eats sausages in the morning i don't know you know it's like it's some weird stuff everywhere you go things that are not expected um but i had a a, a funny moment earlier where keenan and i both bought a, a special suntory malt beer that said uh yeah it said master's dream on it and that weird tagline appealed to me and he got it as well and i had the thought that like as we're approaching this checkout where two caucasians purchasing the same beverage suntory master's dream premium malt and you can totally imagine a cashier being like oh foreigners drink master's dream <laughs> like it would not be an incorrect uh, conclusion to make i don't know maybe we're contributing to the wackiness is what i'm saying maybe it's my fault anyway i've gone all the way off the rails i don't know how es how esper is gonna end this episode or this series of episodes. I don't know how long this goddamn episode is going to be. This is going to be about five years. This is going to be split across 15 episodes. Maybe I haven't recorded as many things as I thought. Maybe half of them aren't usable. Maybe this is the end of an episode. I don't know. Well, I better stop talking to you because I, I, got, a, I got a personal pudding over there that um, says that it's, it's just for me. Uh, which I'm very excited about. I've been waiting to crack into it. Uh, Kimi dake no pudding. It's a pudding just for me. What am I doing talking to you? I'm gonna go eat my pudding. Goodbye. We'll hear more from Brandon's trip in part two of this episode coming soon. Insert Credit Show is a production of Insert Credit. This episode was hosted by Brandon Sheffield and features Chibitech and Keenan Alpe. Insert Credit Show is edited by me, Esper Quinn, with original music by Kurt Feldman. Thanks for listening.